I'm sure, like me, you had that friend who liked to exaggerate. You know, you took everything they said with a pinch of salt. I remember my friend regaling us with stories of his uncle who was in the paratroopers. It was during the first Iraq war and he gleefully told us how his uncle had been sent in to assassinate Saddam Hussein. It sounded a bit far-fetched. We didn't really be believe him. And each week he'd come in with a new story of what his uncle had done or even what he'd done. And we'd roll our eyes as he shared his latest made-up story. But here's the thing, you know, we couldn't really know if what he was saying was the truth or not. It sounded unbelievable, so we chose not to believe it. We have this inbuilt filter that helps us figure out if something is true or not. It takes its cue from who is giving us the information. If we think they're trustworthy, then we're more likely to believe it than if we don't trust their credibility. You know, you're more likely to believe something you hear on the mainstream news than from the guy down the pub unless he's called Hugh Edwards, that is. Now, this is the final message in a series of videos exploring the Bible. We've looked at what it actually is and how we read it, and today we're going to discover if we can trust it. You know, is the Bible a reliable source? I wonder where you'd put it on the scale of the guy down the pub to the BBC News headlines. And there are a bunch of questions that float around this theme. Things like, isn't the Bible full of contradictions? It's been copied so many times. How do we know that the version we have today is an accurate representation of the original? And how do we know the people who first wrote it were telling the truth? How do we know they didn't just make it all up? The Bible has 66 books with 1,189 chapters and 31,102 verses. How many of these books, chapters and verses do we need to be sure are reliable to know if we can trust the Bible? Now, the reason we want to know if we can trust the Bible is so we can know if we can trust the message that it contains. The big question we're asking is, is it true? And more specifically, is the stuff about Jesus true? Is Jesus really the Son of God? Is he God? Did Jesus really die and come back to life? This is the question that's at the heart of the question that we're asking. The Bible isn't the basis of my faith. A person and an event is. Jesus and the resurrection are the basis of the Christian faith. You know, is Genesis an accurate account of how the world was made? Did Adam and Eve exist? Did Noah build a big boat and gather all the animals together? Did David defeat a giant called Goliath? Now, these are all interesting questions, but when it comes to what we're actually talking about, well, they're irrelevant. You know, whether the world was created in six days or six million years has no bearing on my faith whatsoever. Whether Jesus is who he claims to be and whom his followers claim to be is of complete relevance. Whether Jesus died and came back to life again is vital to my faith. If the resurrection didn't happen, well, then it's game over when it comes to the Christian faith. It's all based and built upon that event. Isn't our understanding of who Jesus is and his resurrection based on the Bible? Well, yes and no. Remember that the Bible isn't a book. It's a collection of books. And we know about who Jesus is and what he did through the Gospels. That's the starting point. So the question is, are the Gospels reliable and trustworthy accounts? Now, I'm going to bring in someone far more intelligent than me to give us some help on this. Here's a clip from a video we use on the Alpha course. Textual criticism examines a number of copies of early texts that we have available to us today. And it looks at the time gap between the original document and the earliest copy that we have. And basically, the more manuscripts we have and the earlier they are, the less doubt there's going to be about the original. So let's compare the Bible to other texts in ancient history, ones that are widely used in schools and universities. Let's look at the Greek historians Herodotus and Thucydides. They both wrote in the 5th century BC. But the earliest copy of their writings that we have dates from AD 900, and that makes a 1,300-year time lapse. And even then, we only have eight copies of these manuscripts in the first place. Or look at the Roman historian Tacitus. There's a thousand-year gap between his book being written and our first manuscript, and we only have 20 copies. 
Or another classic, Caesar's Gallic War, 950 years between the book being written and our first manuscript copy. And even then, we only have nine or ten copies of these manuscripts. Again, with Livy's famous history of Rome, a 900-year gap between the book being written and our first manuscript, and we only have 20 copies of this. But when it comes to the New Testament, well, it's very different. The New Testament was written between about 40 and 100 AD, and we have manuscript evidence going back as early as 130 AD, and full manuscripts by 350 AD. And we have more than 5,300 Greek manuscripts, 10,000 Latin translations, and 9,300 others. So, you know, we can be pretty confident in the accuracy, the authenticity, and the integrity of the New Testament scriptures that have been passed down to us today. The remarkable thing about the Bible is there's such a short chronological distance between the events being described and our first manuscripts. So in many ways, the Bible scholars are in a very fortunate position of being able to check these things out and finding that they are much more reliable than, for example, some of the alternatives you're looking at. And as a scholar, I am more than happy to say, I trust this, I take it very, very seriously, I rely on it. This science of textual criticism is the basis that historians use to show the reliability of any ancient document. To disregard this in relation to the Gospels is to disregard anything from ancient history. The people who know about this stuff generally agree that the Gospels, as we have them today, are reliable and accurate versions of the originals. But that still doesn't answer the question, because how do we know the originals are telling the truth? Who's to say that Matthew, Mark, Luke and John didn't just make this up? You know, Matthew and John were part of the original 12 disciples. They were eyewitnesses to the things that they wrote in their Gospels. Now, Mark was a close associate of Peter and Luke of Paul. They would have had access to the original disciples and the first followers of Jesus. So when Luke wrote his Gospel, he probably had access to Mark and Matthew's Gospels. All three of these Gospels overlap. They incorporate some of the same material. And our assumption is that Mark's was written first, then Matthew, and then Luke. And Luke starts off his gospel by acknowledging that there are other accounts, but that he wanted to thoroughly investigate these events for himself. And so we have to know if we can trust the authors to know if we can trust the gospels as reliable and truthful. So how do we know that Matthew and John didn't just make this up and convince Mark and Luke that their versions are the truth? Well, there's a whole host of evidence to support their credibility and their reliability. First up, Mark's gospel came first. You know, he didn't copy Matthew's or John's. His sources would have been the other eyewitnesses, the other 11 remaining disciples, but also the other people who were around and saw these events unfold. You know, Jesus appeared to large crowds. His words were heard by many and his miracles were seen by many. His crucifixion was witnessed by hundreds of people and hundreds of people saw him walking around again after he was crucified and after he was buried. There were enough people to say that these claims were false if they were false. But let's keep digging. Now, if the disciples were lying, well, we need to ask ourselves, why? What's the benefit to them? The most compelling motivation behind an elaborate hoax like this would be power. Now, they lived at a time when the Roman Empire was in control and the religious authorities seemed powerless to gain control of Jerusalem and Israel. They were a nation under siege and perhaps they wanted to start a new movement that would overthrow the Romans, a new movement with themselves as the leaders of this new world order. Now, that could sound plausible apart from these huge halts. Firstly, if they were making this stuff up, why would they include things that made them look stupid? You know, the death and resurrection of Jesus is the turning point. It's where this movement really starts to gain traction. And the Gospels record the moments when Jesus told his disciples that he would die and three days later come back to life. He predicted it before it happened. Yet the Gospels also show how the disciples didn't believe him. According to the Gospels, When Jesus died, the disciples were hiding in fear. 
When Jesus came back to life, they were nowhere to be seen, even though Jesus had told them what would happen. The Gospels tell us that Peter was so afraid that he denied knowing Jesus after Jesus was arrested. And this wasn't to a Roman guard or to one of the religious leaders. It was to a teenage girl. The Gospels record that Peter was afraid of a teenage girl. Well, I actually understand that one. You know, they can be a bit scary. Now, if you were making all of this up, and the reason you were making up was to kickstart a new movement with yourself as the leader of it, you wouldn't put this stuff in. It doesn't add to their credibility. It doesn't make them appear like strong, powerful people who are worth following. According to the Gospels, the first eyewitnesses to the resurrection were women. Now, if the resurrection was made up, you wouldn't put the first eyewitnesses to be women. In their culture, the testimony of a woman wasn't valid. It wasn't trustworthy. Now, I'm thankful that this is no longer the case in our world. But we do have to ask why the authors of the Gospels included this in their account. It doesn't give their story more credibility or authority. It actually undermines it. And one last point. Ten of the remaining 11 disciples were brutally murdered for their faith in Jesus and their belief in the resurrection. They were crucified, beaten, stabbed and thrown in boiling oil all because of their faith in Jesus and the resurrection. And we don't actually know how the 11th disciple died. He certainly suffered because of his faith. Surely, if they were making this up, at least one of them would have admitted it to escape the fate that awaited them. If they were making this up, if Jesus wasn't really whom the Gospels claim him to be, if he didn't really do the things that the Gospels claim he did, why would they write things that make themselves look less favourable? Why would they document their disbelief? Why would they include evidence that undermines the authority of the message? And why would they be willing to be brutally tortured and executed for this made-up story? And if this is all made up, how did 11 uneducated men from a nowhere region in the armpit of the Roman Empire start a movement that would not only replace the seat of power in the Roman Empire, but change the course of human history forever. If you're a fan of Sherlock Holmes, you probably have come across a concept called Occam's Razor. It gives us a principle for logical thought, and basically, it suggests that when faced with a problem or competing theories, the simplest one is the correct one. Now, if we apply this principle to the question of the reliability of how truthful the gospel accounts are, then the simplest solution is the correct one. And as we've seen, the simplest solution is that they didn't make this up. The simplest solution is that the events that are recorded in the Gospels actually happened. So if you're someone who's curious or even skeptical about faith, you don't need to ask if every verse in every chapter of every book in the Bible is true. You just need to ask if the Gospel accounts are true. The foundation of the Christian faith isn't the Bible. It's in Jesus and his resurrection. But what does that actually mean for the rest of the Bible? You know, do we actually need it? The Bible is a gift to help us better understand who God is and the story of his relationship with humankind. It's a gift to help us understand who Jesus is and what it means to follow him. It's a gift that God uses to speak to us today. And I know that sounds a bit weird. I guess it's just one of those things that you have to experience to understand. As I engage with the Bible, my focus is on the Gospels. This is the starting point and it's the basis for my understanding of everything else that this amazing gift contains. I've got a bunch of questions about a bunch of stuff in it, especially things in the Old Testament, but I'm willing to lean into it because according to the message of the Gospels, Jesus gave them attention and value. Jesus thought that they were important writings. Jesus' faith in the scriptures is enough to give me faith in them because of my faith in him. If somebody is able to predict their own death and that they'll come back to life and pull it off, well, I'll just go with whatever they say. I think that we can say that we can trust the Bible because we can trust Jesus, because we can trust the Gospels. Now, that doesn't mean that everything in the Bible is there for us to replicate, 
You know, everything in the Bible isn't telling us that we should replicate it. In fact, the only thing we have to replicate is how Jesus summed up the instructional message of Scripture. Love God through loving the people around you. The Bible is given to help us follow Jesus through doing this. So let's get on with it. 